on This Week in Enterprise Tech, Big Data, Mega Mergers, and Mega Power. Twyant on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 142, recorded May 29th, 2015, Data Center Power. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by PagerDuty. Get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you'll also get a free t-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support. And by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, and you can connect Dropbox for Business with over 300,000 apps for project management. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm joined by my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the slightly fried director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, Brian, we'll talk about why you're, you're really fried out in just a bit, but uh, otherwise, how are you? I'm uh, more tanned. I'm sure you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Well, you live in Hawaii, right? Sun's yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tease the audience a little bit about what we're going to be talking about? Yeah. Um, I was, I'm actually part of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and we were putting in a grid monitoring system on the island of Maui in Kihei. That's right, folks. If you've ever wondered about the smart grid, which is an enterprise topic, by the way, Brian Chi is on the forefront. Uh, someone, who el uh, someone else who is on the forefront is our good friend and official host of the Twit TV network, Mr. Lou Maresca, a senior software lead over at Microsoft. Lou, sliding into the co-host seat here. It's so good to have you, sir. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. We love your opinions. Now, let's go ahead and jump straight in to the blips. This first one is, uh, well, surprise. The cloud still needs physical servers. Now, I know that it sounds ludicrous to the Twyat right, but there are still people out there who think that the cloud eliminates the need for bare metal servers. Well, the latest report from Gartner should help them see the light. With infrastructure spending for the cloud at an all-time high, server vendors have reported the strongest quarter ever for server shipping growth over, well, over the last four years. In quarter one, 2015, Driven by the sale of hyperscale servers, massively distributed systems that can utilize thousands of nodes for big data and cloud-based processing. Shipments of servers grew 13% year over year in quarter one, which is up 2.7 million units shipped on 13.4 billion revenue, which increases by 18%. That's a lot of numbers there. That growth was split across all form factors from towers to racks to blades, with Dell and HP raking in the lion's share of revenue and volume. Breathing new life in aging computers, supercomputers are normally clustered together in several different common network topologies based on the tasks they need to perform using cable-connected switches that link together cabinets of server groups. Um, using, the, using the same uh, topologies uh, to perform numerous opera operations or parallel tasks that are not related is sometimes very inefficient uh, using that same topology. So essentially, you're bound by your network topology. Uh, in Beam's FSO, which is free space optics, which doesn't rely on fixed net topologies. FSO uses laser light to transmit data through the air from one terminal to another in, in its line of sight. FSO has a wide gigabit scale bandwidth using the provided line of sight communications between almost any two cabinets. And so far, research has found that FSO can reduce the latency up to 9% with a 36% reduction in fiber optic cable length. Sharks with laser beams. Beware the message of death. It seems that someone has found yet another series of special characters called glyphs that in a specific combination can cause iOS devices and potentially OS X devices to crash. Shades of Harry Potter. 
At this moment, the only defense is to turn off previews on your device by going to notifications, messages, show previews, and turn it all off. Well, here at Twyatt, we welcome our Android overlords. One of the stats that graced the keynote by Sundar Pichai at Google I.O. 2015 was that in the past year, over 600 million users around the world moved up to smartphones and that 80% of that stat chose Android. Add to that the billion people who are currently using Android, the 900 million on Gmail, and the mega monolith monster that is YouTube, and well, it's a good year for Google. With just one little wrinkle. Though Android is dominating market share, according to Ken Cod Genuity and an analyst Michael Walkley, iOS is still raking in 93% of the profits to be had in the smartphone arena. It looks to be shaping up like the old Mac PC debate, with Android holding a massive user base advantage, but iOS having users who are willing to pay more. Cleaning pots or smartphones revealed at Google I.O. another entry into the network of Internet of Things. Google Brillo is not to clean pots, but it's stripped down version of Android designed to run on household devices like refrigerators, air conditioners, light switches, door locks, etc. Along with Brillo, Google revealed a new protocol called Weave. Weave's intention is to standardize the way device each device in the home broadcasts its abilities and what it's doing at that moment in time. Sounds like the IoT team building events. With Apple HomeKit, Home Microsoft HomeOS, and Samsung SmartThings, Google has entered a crowded space with more options. At this point, we're no, with, there's no real examples, so only time will tell on the adaption and how far it will go. IRS has hacked for more than 100,000 people's information. Oh, dear. The Internal Revenue Service has discovered around 10,000 accounts have been compromised and has shut down the Get Transcript application until further notice. Apparently, attempts were made on 200,000 accounts, but many failed due to incorrect identification information inputted by either the IRS or users. The full impact of the attempt by financial fraudsters won't be known until further investigation, but it seems the information was used to file false claims. Google has glass, Microsoft has HoloLens, and now Apple is getting into the augmented reality game with the purchase of Germany-based Metal.io. Apple would neither confirm nor deny the acquisition, which is standard operating procedure for Apple. But those close to the matter have said that the deal is actually done. Metal I.O. is known for their SDK that includes a capture component, sensor interface, rendering component, and tracking technology. Apple will get expertise in application hosting and delivery as a service. And the Metal I.O. site now says that further kits are unavailable for purchase and that current subscriptions will be honored until expiration. Welcome to AR. Apple reality. Well, that's it for the blips. Let's go ahead and step into the bites. Now, gents, I know that right now, actually right very now, at the moment of this recording, Google I.O. is going on not too far away, about 37 miles south at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. Uh, uh, we deliberately didn't want to do any deep dives on Google I.O. because right now a lot of stuff is speculation. We covered two short bits in our blips, but we're going to move on, especially since a lot of the news that Google has been releasing is kind of primary uh, versions. I, I, don't, I don't really want to get into it. So instead, let's go ahead and talk about something that we know that Twyatt Wright loves to talk about, and that is big data and tracking. But this time, maybe there's a way to track without really tracking. Now, this day, these days, we are a bit touchy about our digital privacy, and more of us are starting to see words and phrases like big data and metadata as... Well, a nefarious thing. Now, even if we're promised a useful result, there's always this sort of pushback against anything that's going to be tracking the technology that we use. Well, research has been conducted by a trio of researchers at the University of Warwick's Warwick Business School that might be able to give us the results of big data tracking without all the nefarious connotations of metadata, Big Brother, and the NSA. Now, specifically, they're looking into the ability to track using big data analytics to predict the movements and the growth of crowds, large crowds. The way that they're doing this is they're looking at cell phone data. Now, now they're not actually looking at the data that's running out of phones. What they're looking at is activity. They're looking at how many SMSs are sent. They're looking at how many phone calls are made. They're looking at how many tweets go out through the, telephone, uh, the cell phone network. Now, since they're not actually looking at what users are doing, so this is beyond metadata. They're not actually, they're not saying, well, we're only capturing the header of the information. They're saying we just, we, all we get is the large picture. 
They're saying it shouldn't trigger as many judicial oversight issues, and they're hoping that it won't trigger a backlash from the public. Now, Chiebert, I want to throw this to you first. Is this just a distinction without a difference? They're saying, look, we, we're not getting any of that metadata stuff. We're just getting activity stats. But in order for them to get activity stats, it still means that the telco must be collecting the metadata. They must actually be looking at the traffic, and then they parse it out in order to give it to the researchers. It, it, is, is, that, is that really different from what we've got right now? Oh, it most definitely is. This is definitely a layer of abstraction and very much reminds me of the training I had when I had to go through medical research, you know, the HIPAA regulations. By removing yourself, one, you're removing the real-time component, which is what a lot of people really don't like. Uh, but secondly, it's almost like looking at syslogs rather than the actual data. Um, so it allows you to get the slightly after the fact um, data on where things are going, what are you doing, and things like that. But it's you know no real time and no super detailed. So hopefully, if the telcos are doing it right, they're not storing any of the real detailed information. You're just passing you know the syslog. And, and actually, this is a very good point. But I think that's the problem there because you have to count on the telco doing the right thing. Now, Lou, let me throw this over to you because I, I think what Brian has said is, is absolutely important. It's not real time. There is a, what looks like a really strong layer of abstraction. You should not be able to reassociate any of the activity with identities because it's not looking at individual devices. It's just looking at how many calls are being made. You know, are we seeing groups of calls start to come together, which means that the crowd's actually gonna grow. Is, is that strong enough? Because all it takes is for one telco to do something silly and actually maintain the metadata, maintain the actual packets, so that you can reverse from the generalized big data analytics back into individual packets. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of big companies out there today, Google, Microsoft, I mean Google has their analytics, Microsoft has telemetry. I mean, these all these companies do very similar things when you're using their products. They send big data up, it's supposed to remove it sanitized data, it's supposed to remove any recognizable PII from the data, personal identifiable information from the data. And then they should be able to run analytics on that. And so that's really what this is. Um, you know, and again, predictive analysis or analytics really comes from accumulating a bunch of data. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Um, as long as it doesn't have PII. So, I mean, I guess it makes sense from what they're doing. But again, there's there's a lot of factors, and I'm sure you'll get into it, a lot of factors that might cause the data to fail. I mean, you know, there's radio silence is issues. You know, maybe there's some service providers that don't have, don't have service in that area, which will skew the data results. So when they're trying to do predictive analysis on less data, that can cause even more problems. So I guess there's some there's some failure there. Chibert, what what could some larger big data companies like Facebook and Google take from this uh, because they are starting to feel the backlash of, of personal data, private data being <clears throat> misused in the eyes of the customers. How do you get to that non-real-time layer of, 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 of abstraction for something like Facebook? Well, it's, again, logs. Logs are not real-time data. It is close to real-time, but it's not real-time. And so the biggest usage that I'm seeing that's everybody's chomping at the bit for is actually retail analytics. How do you predict buying habits? Because that's what, in the end of, end, of, end of the day, that's what pays the bills. People buying stuff, and that's what drives the U.S. economy. People buying, people selling, people being able to more efficiently sell. So having this type of analytics is not necessarily a bad thing. It means maybe Walmart's going to have the right number of razors and the razors that you actually like. It might mean uh, stores might shift their hours to meet the needs of the population. So I don't see this as a bad thing. Um, I think, you know, the tripping point, again, is someone doing something silly and storing too much. I agree with Lou that having too little is just as bad as having too much. Um, but I think somewhere along the line, there's going to have to be some balance. And I'm hoping the industry can do it themselves and not have to require regulation because we all know how well regulation works, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think you're absolutely right in that this could work as long as everyone in the chain being passed down with the data acts in good faith and acts intelligently. Because if, if there's always a layer of abstraction separating every step from every other step, you do get really good anonymization. 
But if someone fails to do their due diligence in making sure that the data remains anonymized or that the data remains stripped, then you now have a nightmare. Yeah. Let's go ahead and move on to the next enterprise buy because we've actually got a, a few and I do want to get to our guest because we're going to be talking about a fantastic topic on data centers and power in just a bit. But this one, well, I'm surprised that there was a lot of news about this and then it kind of died out. This, this happened at the beginning of the week and by now, by the end of the week, e every bit of news has been replaced by what's going on at Google I.O. And that is that now that Time Warner and Comcast will be no more, Charter has announced that they have made and have received approval for a bid to purchase Time Warner. Now, earlier this week, Charter announced that they, they had reached that agreement for $55 billion. Of course, this comes on the heels of Comcast's $45.2 billion attempt to purchase Time Warner that was torpedoed because they couldn't prove in any concrete way, concrete way that it would be anything but a negative for consumers. Now, before we get all speculative, here's what we actually know. This will merge the second and the fourth largest cable providers in the United States. This will become a strong number two behind Comcast for largest customer base in the United States. Charter is paying $195.71 per share. That's a large premium over their stock price and way more than the $158.82 that Comcast was offering. This is a 50% increase from Charter's 2014 bid that Time Warner actually turned down in favor of Comcast. Charter is also purchasing Bright House Networks, which is a small cable operator, and altogether the merged entity will serve 23.9 million cable, broadband, and phone customers in 41 states, including New York, Dallas, and Los Angeles. There's also a $2 billion walkaway fee for Charter, so if the deal breaks up after this point, they are on the hook for a large check to Time Warner. Now, I'm going to throw this to, to, to you first, Lou. Of course, people are going to be asking, if Comcast Time Warner couldn't make it, why should we allow Charter Time Warner? Isn't it just the same thing? Aren't we just allowing the consolidation of these big entities into even bigger entities? Isn't this going to be just as bad for the American consumer as Comcast Time Warner was going to be? What would be your response? I'd say bring on the competition. Take down the big guy, make the big guy actually, uh, you know, have some competition in this in the race. Right now, there isn't. I mean, Comcast doesn't is 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 allowed to just throw money around all over the place, and and I think that this will bring that competition in 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 the, in the scope, and I think that will actually. So when people say, "Is this really a monopoly takeover?" I mean, granted, it is merging, you know, the third and fourth largest companies, but in the same sense, it's going to add to the competition race and it will maybe potentially even drive costs down. So I think this this has some merit to it than more so than the Comcast deal. I think you're right, Lou, because even though we, we could look at this and say, wait a minute, it's, it's still involving Time Warner. It's still involved in making a monolith. It's making a monolith that can challenge another monolith. It's a monopoly that can challenge a monopoly. Time Warner and Comcast would have accounted for more than half of all the subscribers in the United States. Charter and Time Warner will account for about 30%. So even though it's big, it's not Comcast big. And so that's what a lot of people are saying. A lot of people are saying, well, maybe we, we can't encourage someone to create a brand new company that's going to challenge the likes of Comcast. But if we could get two large companies to duke it out, that's good for the consumer, right? I mean, that then we actually get to the market will adjust because you've got two companies that have an, uh, the same amount of financial resources that have pretty much the same user base that can go at it head to head. Chibert, there is another thing here. And actually, it was mentioned in the chat room. I'm sorry, it scrolled away. And that is Comcast was just seen as the bad guy. Charter doesn't have nearly the reputation as Com of Comcast. So is that why people really don't care? It's sort of like, oh, Charter? Yeah, I haven't heard anything about ba bad about them. Go ahead and let them buy it. Well, Comcast earned that reputation. I mean, they really and truly earned it. And people that aren't even served by Comcast hate Comcast because of all the negative press, all the negative opinions being slung around. Charter seems to have done a much better job uh, I have actually heard good things said about Charter. I'm actually a Time Warner customer, and so far, my customer service has been relatively good. I, like all the rest of the consumers in the world, hate that they say, well, we'll be there in the morning. Well, what does morning mean? You know, you know that's something everybody hates about the industry. 
But I think the Charter Time Warner merger might be good. And yes, I'm totally in agreement. I am totally after the laissez-faire model of business. I would really, really, really like to see an entity big enough that they can beat on Comcast and hopefully drive some innovation because the Doxis protocol that they use for their cable boxes has an amazing amount of flexibility and we're not going to see really, really cool features until there's enough competition to drive that. Uh, one thing that we haven't seen from the cable companies yet is managed desktops. Now, wouldn't that be cool if my cable box could run a desktop that I could do things on so I don't have to have a full machine in my home if I don't want it? Right, right. JJ to the 4884 is asking, uh, what about Google Fiber? And yeah, Google Fiber is a disruptive force, but I think it's more disruptive on speed. I mean, Google doesn't have anywhere near the user base, anywhere near the reach of a Comcast, a Time Warner, a Charter, even a Cox cable. So yeah, uh, good, but it, it's not big enough. I, I think this actually creates an entity that's big enough. And there's another thing here at play. The thing that really, really jabbed at the Comcast Time Warner uh, merger when they were asked how would this be good for the consumer is the vertical integration that Comcast have. Because they're not just a cable delivery system, they're also a content creation system. They've got NBC. And they could not prove that they would not, nor that have they have not, abused that position as the largest cable provider in the United States to favor their content over other content. Charter doesn't have that baggage. They are not a big content creation house. So they're not going to be tempted to say, oh, well, you know what? Maybe Netflix will count against your cap, but NBC Universal Online won't. Uh, so that's, that's something to consider. There is something else I do want to bring out here, though. And Lou, I want to throw this over to you first because you brought up competition. One of the things I would like to see in this merger, just like I was hoping to see in the Comcast Time Warner merger, was a commitment to actually compete head to head. What we have seen with these regional cable uh, operations is that they may compete because they're all cable services, but they don't actually compete in the same regions. It's, it's almost a hands off. It's like, well, that belongs to Comcast. This is our territory. We don't want you coming to our territory, so we won't go into yours. Would, do you think there would be a way to structure this deal for the FCC to put in some sort of stipulation to say, if you want this merger, if you want to be number two, you have to, you have to agree to exist in half of the cities that Comcast also exists in. I mean, I know it's a dream, but that's, that would be good, right? I mean, that's, that's the dream for the consumer to actually say, wow, I can choose between Comcast or Charter Time Warner. And it's the same, the same kind of service and they compete on price. Absolutely, I think I think it would add to the deal. I think it would help. I would help the competition side of things. But again, they're they're solely sometimes restricted by local governments and cities and states. Um, like for instance, uh, I used to live in Fargo, North Dakota, way out there, and they had an exclusivity deal with a local cable company, and that meant it was almost like a legal monopoly in that case. And there was no room for anybody to come in and add their infrastructure or even their services there. And so, I mean, there's there's all there's those types of things all over the country. So adding that to the deal might not uh, you know make it as successful as we think in that case because of those types of restrictions. We've got people in the chat room who are, the, our chat room is very jaded. They're saying actual competition. Yeah, that's, that's never going to exist. Uh, Chiebert, let me throw this out to you. When, back, let's go back 15 years. The FCC wanted to see intramodal competition. So they thought, well, if a city can have cable, satellite, and DSL, then you've got three options and we can say there's competition. They have changed under Wheeler's administrative might to say, no, you, you need intermodal. You need to have two cable companies. You need to have two companies that offer the fastest speed that are in the same area in order for you to consider it real competition. Because right now, let's be honest, unless you are in one of those super lucky, rare areas that has either Verizon or AT&T that offer gigabit fiber, your DSL does not compete against cable, not even close to competing against cable. What do we need to get to that, that intermodal? All right. Sorry, I live in one of those lucky areas. You know, Hawaiian Telephone. This is, is why actually, we hate you, Chibert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hawaiian Telephone is actually delivering fiber from the curb and delivering television service. And they are just beating the crap out of the market. It's great. My cable TV subscription costs have dropped. My internet costs have dropped. 
my I just got an email from Time Warner saying, oh, you're not going to have to pay any more. We're going to jump your speed. Um, so my home is now supposedly within the next month or so going to go to 300 megabits per second. So I've actually now have to go and get myself a TZ300 so that I have a firewall that can actually keep up. My firewall is my bottleneck, which is awesome. So my, my thing is, yes, um, competition is awesome. Having multiple vendors being able to provide it is awesome. I love it. Um, the just, you know, what's happened just absolutely. We need more competition and we, and it's possible your telcos. Um, a lot of them have already applied for licenses with the public utility commissions across the United States to also be able to deliver television, um, along with data and things like that. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. And I think a lot of what's happening now is being driven by the new rules in the FCC. So go FCC. I like what you're doing. Exactly. I, I, I think, of course, the Twilight Riot knows this because they paid attention to all of these things. But a, a large part of the public of the United States doesn't realize that right along with the net neutrality regulations was that landmark FCC decision to open up the markets, to open up the polls, to make it easier for a competitor to come into an area without all the red tape that was set up by the 1986 Telecommunica Cable Communications Act. Sorry about that. So hopefully we'll, we'll see that stretch into the future. Now, uh, Chibert, I, I know we promised to talk about uh, the SmartNet installation. Could we bump that to next week? I, I, I want to give our guest full time and I don't want to short shrift the project that you're doing. Can we make that the feature topic for next week? Oh, no, that's no problem at all. In fact, the Maybe I'll have more pictures by then. Let's do that. So, folks, I'm sorry. We're going to have to tease you. Uh, Chibert, if you were to give them a one-minute description of what you were doing to really whet their appetite, what would it be? It is, in a nutshell, just how much power does PV feed back onto the grid and how well is the grid handling it? This answer is what's going to really help drive the decisions by the public utility commissions. Wow. You, so you've got multiple cable operators and you've got cool PV. <sighs> got lots of sun. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, when we come back, uh, I want to take you over to NAB because we talked to a vendor there who was actually using Internet as a uh, uh, infrastructure, as a service uh, to, to drive their product. And we're going to be speaking with PrimeStream in just a bit. But before we do that... Let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, the tech that we use in the enterprise gets smarter and more reliable every year. We have servers that will automatically fail over. We have switches that will automatically fail over. We've got tools that will tell us exactly where problems are. But no matter how smart our tools get and no matter how redundant our gear may become, you want to be woken from your sleep when there's a problem before it becomes an issue for your customers, which is why we're happy to have PagerDuty as a sponsor of the Twilight Riot. PagerDuty is an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to help increase the uptime of your apps, your servers, your websites, and your databases. It connects all of your systems into a single view, allowing you to see critical events across all your monitoring tools. That's a single pane of glass. It's an essential service if your business needs your software and services to be up. And, well, honestly, if you've got a business today, it has to be up. It has over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, App Dynamics, or you could roll your own with PagerDuty's APIs. You can customize it to fit how you and your team work, regardless of location or size. You don't have to fit your work process to fit the tool. The tool changes for you. Now, here's how it works. When there's an incident, PagerDuty will first look through all your monitoring tools. It will filter and deduplicate the alerts, because you're going to get the same alerts on multiple tools, and only then will it alert the proper staff. This reduces noise and false alerts and makes sure that only actionable alerts are actually delivered. After reducing that noise, PagerDuty checks your on-call schedules and personalizes the alerting preferences to automatically alert the right team and the right team member. Those alerts are dispatched by automated phone calls, SMS, email, and push notifications. It's distributed across multiple data centers and multiple hosting providers so that there's no reason why your people would ever miss an alert. Now, if alerts are missed for some reason or another, normally related to your employee, PagerDuty will automatically escalate the issue to another team member until it's responded to. 
All of this means is that nothing, no issue will ever drop between the cracks. Of course, PagerDuty isn't just content to tell you about the problems. Its analytic tools will, will also identify common problems, allowing you to proactively make system improvements and prevent future outages. PagerDuty is trusted by thousands of companies, including Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box. You should trust them, too. Now, right now, you can get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. When you sign up for a new account, you'll also get a free T-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. When we come back, we're going to be speaking with Mark Swift, who's going to tell us all about power in the data center. But before that, let's take a trip over to NAB and have a little chit-chat with PrimeStream. When you think of Microsoft, you probably think of data centers, desktops, tools to control your data. You probably don't think of Microsoft as a way to control your assets and definitely not a way to control your workflow. Well, here at PrimeStream at NAB 2015, I'm standing next to Warren Ehrenstein, who's going to explain why Azure may be your next workflow master. Thank you very much for talking to us. It's a real pleasure, and you're correct, Father. It is time to start thinking of Microsoft as the place to manage your assets. They've built a remarkable media services platform, this Azure. It's the ability in the cloud to, to manage large amounts of content, create collaborative workflows between between multiple locations and allow people to do all the things that they've really had to depend on massive physical infrastructures to do it now in the cloud. It's really exciting to be partnering with a company like Microsoft. Uh, when I think of asset management on a large scale, especially remotely, I'm thinking of um, you know, Cameron and filming The Abyss or filming Avatar where you have these huge asset files that are just difficult to share and it's very difficult to work in a collaborative fashion without shipping a hard drive across the world. You've kind of come up with a solution for that. Can you show us how this works? Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure. Um, what we've got here, our interface here, allows us to um, collect large quantities of content to be able to uh, view this content and, and uh, annotate the content. A really important part of this process is to be able to do things like create markers. And these individual frames now, I can associate specific bits of metadata with this marker. And, and uh, anybody else on the system then is going to be able to see that kind of information. I can also create subclips, little ranges of information within the uh, clip that I can give uh, uh, feedback to my uh, uh, to my coworkers that this is an important part of the clip. And like you referenced, uh, Father, that you know, James Cameron is creating huge amounts of content. Well, guess what? We're all creating huge amounts of content these days. Everybody's generating content, and everybody needs a system to be able to manage it and to be able to share it across remote locations. And that's what, you know, that's what we're the, having the backbone of a company like Microsoft to allow us to do that. It's really gratifying. We're the tool set on top of that to allow people to do these kinds of workflows. Oh, one of the things that I really like about your solution is the ability to proxy various versions of, of an asset. So, for example, let's say you've got a, a day of shooting. Well, you can upload that to, to PrimeStream, working off of Azure, and then you can have versions on YouTube that people will pull down, they'll annotate, they'll say, you know what, this one I would pre prefer to use in this place, this one I would prefer to use in this place, this I would like to pull the full asset file down, and they can really choose how they integrate into the workflow rather than you telling them this is how the workflow is, you got to figure out how you're going to fit. Absolutely. We don't always have the pleasure of being direct connected to the internet, hardwired through level three. Not everybody's got that kind of bandwidth at home. So the ability to choose multiple uh, multiple versions of the uh, of the clip and uh, and choose through the different resolutions, and then as uh, Father indicated, to publish these to, uh, let me update that there, just a couple of minutes ago, we published this clip from here, our Azure demo. Here it is on YouTube. On YouTube. I can comment on it right from here. I can create a string of, uh, of comments about it. So you can see that we're, we're utilizing our tool set and taking advantage of, of what the internet already provides to, uh, to, to uh, provide and enable these really powerful media sharing workflows. Warren, thank you very much for talking to us. It's been my pleasure, Father. Now, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. If they want to find out more about PrimeStream, about what PrimeStream can do for them, where do they go? Primestream.com. That's a www.primestream.com. There you have it. Primestream plus Azure, your next workflow.
Uh, Chibert, that was at the end of the day of shooting. I was really tired. I could barely understand what I was saying. And then I went to edit the video later on. I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect for Twyatt. Uh, this is something that you would love to use at a university, right? I mean, you generate a lot of content that you need to share across the world. Yeah, the last time we made a guesstimate of how much video and stills and things like that and audio that we had, I think we came up with like seven petabytes. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I qualifies. Oh, well, actually, then let me th let me throw over. I mean, we might as well have him. Uh, we've we've got him here. Let's let's talk to him. Lou, you're a fan of Azure. I had no idea that Azure could do this. I I knew I, Azure was a highly available system. It was great for databases. It was great for pulling data. I had no idea that you could do this sort of proxy sharing of massive multimedia files for synchronized editing in real time. I, that that just kind of boggled my mind. What what has gone in the back end to make that possible? You know, there's a massive amount of distributed computing going on there. There's a lot of services that do this today. There's a company called Huddle. Uh, they do for um, for sports comp uh, sports groups. Um, they do uh, you know massive data processing and video processing for you know coaches and so on and so forth. Um, they do the same thing. Uh, there's there's services that do it for you know, you know training sites and video training sites. Some of them do video conferencing even. So there's I mean there's there's a massive amount of distributed computing going on. Data centers working together making sure that you get the, the lowest latency possible. And, and you know, a lot of these cloud services are starting to offer this ability to be able to put services like like these types of things up there uh, with the lowest amount of latency possible. Yeah, I mean, this is a really specialized infrastructure as a service service because essentially what they've done, the way it was explained to me, is they allow you to upload a very small version of the media files that you're playing with at the moment into Azure, which can then be shared. And as people are making edits, then it's pulling down the larger files. Which which gives the people the, the ability to immediately edit a day's take, uh, like, for example, when you're dealing with 7, 10, 100 petabytes worth of data without having to wait for all that data to sync to all the different locations. But but even so, even though it's it's more of a thumbnail version, the, the amount of power that you need to be able to sync that between all the zones in which the structure, the infrastructure maybe maybe exists, it's, it's mind boggling. So, uh, hey, uh, Lou, if you could go down the hall and go talk to the Azure guys, could you just pat them on the back, say, hey, well Let you know. Yeah, definitely. Just tell them, <laughs> Twyatt, Twyatt likes it. Yes. Let's do that. <laughs> Actually, that will be a special. All right, when we come back, we're going to be talking all about power in the data center. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, let me ask you, and actually, I know the answer to this before I ask you. Do you use Dropbox? Of course you use Dropbox. You're part of the Twyatt Riot. You know that it's the easiest way to sync files, no matter what files they may be across your desktops, across your, your laptop, across your mobile devices, between people who work together. Now, we have used it here in the Twit Brick House to share calendars, to share multimedia files. In fact, if you watch any of my shows, and if you've ever seen a pre-recorded video, something like the video we just saw from PrimeStream, or the videos I make from Maker Faire or from CES, well, I use Dropbox because I edit all of those in my home studio back in San Francisco. When I'm done, they automatically get pushed into my Dropbox, which synchronizes with the TriCaster here in the studio. It's one of the ways that we've used this service, and it has never, ever failed us. Well, that's great, and I know that you use Dropbox, and it's an easy solution for you because, well, it's probably already on your computer but did you know that there's actually a Dropbox specifically designed for business? It's used by over 4 million offices across the world as a way to stay up to date, to sync as a team, and to grow as quickly as possible. It is that same easy-to-use Dropbox that you know, that your employees know, that you've used for years and years, but it has a lot of IT magic. Now, if you're worried about space, don't, because Dropbox for business starts off with one terabyte, and it's easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. Most importantly for IT professionals, this is that IT magic I talked about, Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure that only the right people get access to sensitive company data. Uh, Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration solutions like SIEM, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control and compliance. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for data both in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize the files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on or two-step verification. 
Now, if you want to give it a try, and honestly, who wouldn't want to give it a try, take advantage of your employees' fami familiarity with Dropbox by signing up for Dropbox for business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. And we thank Dropbox for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's go ahead and move on and thank the, uh, the guest of today's show, Mr. Mark Swift. He is the Director of Marketing at uh, Universal Electronic Corporation. Mark, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Padre. Excited to be here. Thank you, Brian and Lou as well. Now, we, we approached your company about this idea a while back. We said, look, we, we want to speak to someone who can give us a nuts and bolts start to finish view of what it takes to make a data center in the modern IT world. We've talked a lot about it here on Twight. I mean, it's it's a popular subject. We've got geeks. We've got geeks who spend a lot of their time with a lot of machines. But you can give us an interesting perspective, a unique perspective on what it takes to create a modern data center. So let's go ahead and kick it off with that. The, the first question I would have for you is, what would you say are the biggest challenges in designing and deploying a data center today? Well, really, from a flexibility perspective, a lot of the data centers today are revamps of existing facilities. And uh, we continue to see scenarios where people are running out of power. And uh, the legacy, what I'll call legacy design methodologies, where you brought in uh, uh, PDU units and then those then fed RPP units out on the data center floor. Um, and then from there, you whipped out uh, cable whips under a raised floor to your racks. It was a very kind of restrictive architecture from a um, redesign perspective. So you're running out of power, you're out of breaker positions in a lot of these RPP panels. So really, as these facilities have evolved, now you're at a point where, okay, what do we do? We don't have the flexibility to move forward. And uh, people are really starting to look at, okay, what's a better way to deploy data center or power within the data center facility? And um, that's where we come in. Uh, we manufacture an overhead power distribution uh, product called Starline Track Busway. Uh, we've actually been in the data center and mission critical space now for uh, over 20 years and uh, starting out in interoperability labs. And really how it's evolved over time, uh, the interoperability labs, so the equipment manufacturers, the Junipers, the Cisco's of the world, uh, had a lot of need for changeover. So having your busway overhead, being able to get in there, reprovision, uh, pull cabinets out, put new ones in, test gear, being able to have a quick method for attaching power to these devices was really a need that they had early on. Well, now as these facilities have evolved and your traditional enterprise data center uh, is looking more like those equipment manufacturers facilities looked maybe uh, 15, 20 years ago, you know, you talk about the Googles and the Yahoos that have a uh, fairly aggressive refresh rate for their facilities now having the ability to go in, take a rack that's fully populated with equipment, uh, unplug a plug-in unit uh, from a busway run that feeds that, pull the old cabinet out, plug the new one in, you plug in your plug-in unit in the busway, turn your breakers on, and you're up and running. So all of those needs that you had before for pulling cables under a raised floor, working in an RPP panel or a PDU panel, all those things go away. So it really gives you a lot of that flexibility that these facilities need for going forward. A dealer in the chat room is asking about RPP or uh, remote power panels. Uh, to be clear to the audience, what you're talking about is a change from what we used to think was a state-of-the-art data center, say, 20 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, where if you wanted to make a proper data center, it had a raised floor. You ran all your power and networking under that floor. You had AC above and maybe even below if you really wanted to push it out. And uh, you would just draw up power. What you've been doing is you've been creating raised bus panels where you could draw down power as you need it. Why? I, I, yeah, you've just kind of explained it. But if you were to explain it in 30 seconds, what's the advantage of drawing down power rather than pulling it up from under the floor? Really, the easiest way to think of it is think about your electrical panel that you may have in your home. And what you've done is you've stretched that panel out directly over those cabinets, and then you can tap off power directly over the point of use. Whereas before, you had a, an RPP panel that may be on the edge of the room, and you were pulling all of those circuits out to the individual panels. So much like in your home, 
think of all the outlets in your different rooms, all of that wiring runs back to your panel in your garage or your basement, you know, wherever you live. Uh, having that uh, ability to tap in power directly over the use uh, gives you tremendous flexibility. I got to say, it's also a lot neater. I, actually, let me bring in Chebert on this. Chebert, the raised floor was great. The first time I ever did a raised floor installation, I thought this is the coolest thing ever. It's going to be so neat. I think within about six months, no one wanted to go under the raised floor anymore because it, just, it was a horrible spider's nest of power cables and network cables. Uh, did, did you experience that? Well, the worst part is, is when you start putting a lot of um, power cables and um, all kinds of goofy things under a raised floor, it disrupts the air patterns. Because mm -hmm. remember, a computer room crack shoves cold air into the raised floor. And in traditional systems, you'd go and put a perforated panel in front of the gear that needed the cold air. So when we did the Pimp My Data Center article for InfoWorld, I believe back in 2008, um, we did two major things that are saving us a lot of electricity. One, we got rid of all those whips under the floor, we got rid of the computer room crack, and we put in the Starline bus bars above. Uh, we have literally paid for the product, uh, you know, literally just in not having to pay an electrician. And the electricians actually like this. They don't, they don't like having to come in to put whips in because there's a lot of disruption. A lot of people get all pissed off. With the star line, even while the bus bar is energized, they can stick the um, tap box in, crank it, bolt it down, not have to shut anything down. And I can remove boxes the same way. And the, the bus bar is underwriter laboratories listed. In theory, I'm never going to try it. You can actually stick a screwdriver into the thing and not electrocute yourself because it's protected. I actually, I did that at a demo. <laughs> uh, scared the crap out of me. But it, no, it did. I'm still here, so woohoo. Uh, Mark, let me ask you about this. What would you say is the, the most underestimated complexity when deploying a data center? Right? What's the one thing that customers come back to you after they tried a deployment and they said, we did not know that this was going to be such a problem. Could you help us with this? Really, it's taking into consideration all the systems working together. So uh, we see a lot of scenarios today where containment strategies strategies are deployed in the facility. So whether you're doing hot aisle, cold aisle, um, chimney cabinets, the, et cetera. Uh, back to Brian's original uh, comment about removing all of the cables from under the floor. You know, you've all seen these scenarios where you have rats nets of cables under a raised floor. And really where those air dams occur or where all those uh, cable whips are going up into the RPP panel. So getting all of that infrastructure out from under the raised floor and uh, using the raised floor for what it was originally intended, which is cooling, is definitely the right way to go. Um, then when you look at whatever containment strategy that you're going to use, um, you know, integrating that um, with the busway and how that's going to be installed or really you need to have that holistic approach to things. So you make sure you have the appropriate clearances for everything, um, you know, uh, drop cord lengths so you can appropriately feed cabinets, all those things and not interfere with your overhead infrastructure. Um, a lot of people are using basket tray and other uh, devices to hang, um, you know, cat five, six uh, fiber cables, et cetera. Uh, once again, making sure all of that stuff has adequate spacing and is all neat and pretty when it's done is really uh, something you want to look at. Uh, now, on Twyte, we've talked a lot about high-density installations. And specifically, we talked about one infamous, I'm not going to mention who it is, but one infamous, super high-density, ridiculously expensive installation that has had a nightmare of power problems. I mean, to the point where you have high voltage plasma arcs being formed between racks because they didn't consider how much that much power in such a small space would interact with, it, with itself. How is it that in this age, when we know so much about the data center, when we know so much about how to build this up, when we have companies like Universal Electric that have decades of running high power applications, that we can still have these missed designs that have cost millions and millions, if not billions of dollars. Really? Yeah, that's a, a very good point. Um, you know, what we've seen, firstly, 
having a proven design topology is definitely something that uh, behooves everyone in these types of installations. Even when you're pushing the envelope as far as high densities, you know, we're seeing, it's funny when I started in this industry um, almost 10 years ago now, you know, three, five kW per rack was uh, the norm. You know, now we actually provide bus for cabinets that are pulling 30 kW. So definitely huge uh, increases in what the, the cabinet KW power usage is now. Um, that being said, uh, one of the things that we really stress with any of our installations is uh, test, test, and retest. Uh, we actually, from at least the power delivery perspective, uh, provide equipment. Uh, we actually have load banks available so you can fully energize and run the bus at what it's rated just to fully verify you know, what those real-world conditions are going to be. And I think in uh, the installation that you're speaking of and several others across the globe, uh, people were looking at theoretical things and maybe a new design and um, didn't go through all the testing that they should, especially in a new design topology and uh, relying on theoretical information uh, versus real-world scenarios, I think caught a lot of people off guard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me ask you another question here. The last time we had a, a power expert on the show, he made it very clear that uh, power was only half the solution, that if you were looking at power solutions, you, you had to link them to cooling solutions. It was no longer you, you had power, and then, then you think about cooling. It was for every watt that I bring in, for every amp that I bring in, I have to worry about this much cooling. How has that advanced since the last time we've had some? I think it was two years ago, near the start of the show, that we last talked about data centers. Is is that now an integral step in the planning process? Uh, definitely. As I mentioned, you know, one of the main things that people will look at, especially with a lot of the containment strategies and uh, really the, the two biggest costs of the facility other than the IT gear is your power usage. Uh, not only from the equipment, but then also from the cooling. Uh, so having those systems linked together, and actually we have people today, this is real world stuff today, which is kind of cool, they're linking the ampacity draw of the busway, so how much power they're consuming with the information system that runs the cooling. So they're integrated systems together, so as that power usage increases, they know that they're using more energy and more energy is of course creating more heat so then they can have their uh, associated crack units or whatever um, cray units whatever they're using to cool their facility then react to those increases in demand throughout the day so you'll see you know spikes everybody has seen those usage charts before what your uh, utilization of your facility is having that information directly interface with your cooling uh, systems is a much better way you know instead of setting your uh, thermometer to run it you know, 72 degrees or whatever um, temperature range you're running your data center facility at today, having it react directly from the power usage is a much more efficient way to do it. And, and actually, that's uh, the more efficient cooling was one of the things that we were able to do once we got away from the raised floor and started using bus bars. Because since we don't have to worry about those air dams anymore, you could design more efficient flow of air. So you didn't have to keep the room at 70 degrees. You could let it rise to 80 degrees and just assume there's not going to be a 30 degree blossom in one corner of the room, uh, which which is nice. Chibert, I want to throw back to you because I remember when I was living in Hawaii, you had a story about UH, a data center that was created that power was an afterthought and it ended up that they had to derate all of the racks in the room. Yeah, it's actually our uh, brand new IT building. Uh, they just spent lots and lots and lots of money. It was only completed um, about eight months ago, I think. Uh, you can only have 7KW per rack. It's like, oops. What was it designed for? Um, I, I was not involved in the, in the planning, so I don't know. <laughs> um, the funny thing is, is they actually um, had a consultant of some sort and apparently the consultant quoted uh, several of my articles and oh, one of the managers no. told told the guys go across the street and talk to this guy and i'm sorry they apparently didn't take any of my suggestions because i showed them the well they actually did i believe do bus bars so good on them uh but they decided to use chimneys and they also put in on the back of some of the key racks that are supposed to be for a supercomputer, 
uh, water-cooled doors, uh, which is just a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, when we changed out for the Pimp My Data Center and actually all our data centers, we went to in-row cracks, in row, you know, put, putting the actual cooling capacity right in between, right at the heat load. And when we measured how much electricity we were using, we were using roughly half of what a traditional crack would use. Uh, plus, we were getting dramatically more efficient cooling by having hot aisle, cold aisle containment and not having all the turbulence that's caused by air dams in the uh, raised floor. Much, much more, more efficient. And because uh, the cracks that I'm using talk to each other, they will actually turn each other on and off and create this model of the room so that they will eliminate hot spots even if we don't evenly load our racks. Right. Mark, let me ask you about that. Uh, how often do you have to fix someone's data center design disaster? Because I, I'm assuming that this actually happens a lot. There's still, there's still entities out there who think that a data center just means you put a lot of servers into one place, put an air conditioner, make sure there's enough power, and you let it run in the dark. How many times do you have to come in? How many times does Universal Electric have to come in and say, okay, this needs to change. You need power here. This got to be, you know, da, da, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are there a lot of data, dis, data center disasters? Fortunately, not as many as you might think. Um, typically, we have had situations where we had gone in and probably the worst case scenario was they actually under specified the impacity of bus that they needed. And we ended up having to take back a fairly sizable order and uh, ship out a you know, higher impacity bus. But typically, the ones that you see, it's a plug in unit configuration changes. So, you know, they, maybe the customer ordered drop cords and they don't have enough height over their cabinets and we had to switch to uh, uh, receptacles directly on the face of the box. So that required us to then remanufacture uh, larger boxes to accommodate the uh, receptacles being integrated into the plug. Uh, people who uh, were interested in monitoring um, and um, maybe didn't specify that on the front end. We've actually added monitoring after the fact, uh, those types of things. So not huge, huge issues, but yeah, we do run in uh, on occasion uh, situations where people didn't take in all of the situation into consideration and we've had to uh help them out with their uh implementations maybe maybe uh, you uh Chibert and i could get together and combine pimp my data center with data center disasters and create a new series for <laughs> tlc or something we go in and we say oh no this is all wrong let's rip it out and change it in 24 hours uh, along along those lines one of the things that we we're talking about in pre-show was this this uh well it's it's, it's a change when I was growing up, a lot of our data centers were in purpose-built areas. You had miniature warehouses that were designed just to provide a lot of power and some sort of security enclosure for, for servers. I'm seeing most of my installations, if not all of my installations, unless I'm actually going to a professional colo, are done in converted business spaces, converted office spaces. Are you seeing that trend as well, or is that just on my, my side of the transaction? There's, um, we're seeing two different sides of the spectrum. So yeah, we, we run into those types of scenarios all the time. Um, and that's typically in your, um, I would say medium to smaller enterprise scenarios. And then a lot of the larger enterprise scenarios, a lot of it's repurpose of a space where they actually take it down to nothing. So it's almost a greenfield type application, um, or greenfield itself. Uh, you know, we all see the, the large, facilities that the likes of Google and Yahoo and Facebook and Apple are building around the world, you know, those are uh, best case scenarios because you're starting from, from scratch. But yeah, a lot of these, uh, like I said, smaller to uh, medium sized enterprise data center applications are uh, repurposed spaces that were never really designed for these. So that adds a whole layer of complexity in itself to the, uh, to the deployment. All right, Mark, last question here, because I, I have to ask it. If, if we're going to be talking about data centers, we also have to talk about DC. DC was trending the last time we talked about data centers, that everything was moving over to DC buses because it was more efficient to make one conversion and then have DC-powered buses going throughout data centers. Have you seen that continue? Is that actually in demand, or was that a pipe dream? No, we're seeing it deployed uh, more overseas than domestically right now. So uh, we have a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of 240 volt DC installations uh, emerging in China. 
And the nice thing about the 240 range is you can take existing servers today and actually plug in 240 and it'll take that in without changing anything out. Um, the power supplies are intelligent enough that they know what's being fed into it and will operate at that voltage. Uh, we see a sh uh, shift in uh, Japan uh, at the 380 volt range, and actually NTT is probably the biggest player that's uh, pushing that over, over in Japan. Uh, and we're starting to see some things emerging here domestically and in, uh, in Europe. Probably the biggest DC installation in Europe would be the Green.ch installation that ABB was a uh, part of. And then domestically here, probably the forerunner uh, from a co-location perspective would be Steel Workout in Princeton, New Jersey. They actually have a DC infrastructure today there that you can actually take equipment in and plug in if needed. And there's a handful of other installations here domestically. Uh, the fact uh, that you can purchase a fully functional system today, I think, is proof that uh, things are going to uh, evolve that way at some point. Um, I think it's going to be as funny earlier in the show, you guys were talking about cables and telco, uh, the cable providers and telecom. You know, they grew up in that DC side of the house. A lot of it was, of course, NEG 48. But um, as those old NEG 48 plants become uh, fully utilized, uh, I could see this as a easy migration path for them because there is gear to step down from 380 to 48 and they can use a lot of the legacy gear and the fact that uh, new gear is available. HP has uh, equipment available. A lot of their uh, uh, blade server chassis you can buy uh, uh, 380 volt power supplies for now as well as their uh, pizza box servers. Um, Cisco has gear out. Uh, IBM, of course, their uh, 7 Series uh, mainframe and, and server platforms can also take in uh, high voltage DC. So it's coming. How widely will it de be deployed and uh, to what extent here domestically? I think that's anybody's ballgame right now. Why is it that you think you're seeing it overseas more than in the United States? Is it just a matter of turnover that they're, they're doing upgrades right now more quickly than we are? A and to follow up on that is when does it make sense and when does it not make sense to go DC? As far as overseas, I see them lagging behind us to some degree, especially in the uh, in the Asian countries. Just from a standpoint of, um, you know, our a lot of our infrastructure was built out. If you look at the growth projections over the last ten years, you know, a lot of infrastructure and facilities have been built here domestically, and um, now that's starting to occur overseas. So there. Are, you know, just at the stage they are now with deploying new technologies and looking at, you know, what's the best way to build a new facility here. They don't have a lot of uh, the history that we have here to, uh, domestically. So they're looking or, or at least willing to try new things. You know, you, you mentioned early in the segment about, you know, whips under a floor where the, you know, 20 years ago, that was how you build a data center here. And, um, People, we, we have long uh, memories here, and once you get a, a proven architecture, we like to repeat things here. Uh, they don't have a lot of that infrastructure in place overseas yet. So, you know, looking at, uh, you know, like I said, 240 in China is uh, not a big thing for them. So uh, from that regard, I think they're a little bit more progressive than we are. Um, so that's uh, – uh, I'll be interested to see, like I said, what the adoption is over uh, domestically here and, and how long that takes to at least get some foothold. As far as where it makes sense, um, like I said, I really think uh, um, that easy migration for the telcos, uh, people who are looking at implementing renewables as well is a great way to, uh, to um, you know, tie the renewables directly into the DC bus. And then, like you mentioned earlier, just elimination of all those conversions back and forth from AC to DC, uh, really see that as a huge play. So, you know, solar, wind, um, you know, anybody that has the Bloom energy cells like eBay, uh, those devices, no, it's a, it's a dirty 380 volt DC. Uh, but, um, you know, having a, a clean version of a DC power out of those boxes and then having equipment directly in the rack that can take that, you know, that's a huge benefit for people. And you have all the benefits of, uh, the power reductions, you know, the, the losses from heat and energy of the conversions back and forth. So I could see those being the first ones here domestically. Anybody who uh, is, in, you know, really interested in deploying renewables as part of their solution. Mark, I want to thank you so very much for joining us for this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Could you please tell the folks who are listening and watching us right now where they can find you, where they can find Universal Electric, where they can find out more about the products and the services that you, you offer? 
Yes, definitely. Thanks for that. Um, we Our website, it's uh, www.starlinepower.com. You can see all of our uh, products that we sell under the Starline brand. And you're, if you're interested in finding out information on uh, Universal Electric, uh, there's links on the site back to uh, www.uecorp.com. So you can look at history and those types of things. But the product pages are can all be found on uh, starlinepower.com. It's Mark Swift, the Director of Marketing for Universal Electronic Corporation. We thank you very much for joining us for Twyatt and uh, for dropping some knowledge about the data center. Sir, we thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, folks, that's it. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten raised floors. I want to thank our panelist, uh, of course, Mark Smith, but also my co-hosts for being here. We wouldn't have a show without them. Let's start with you, Lou. Lou, you're my co-host on Coding 101. We've had you on Twyatt many, many times. You are a rising star here on the Twit TV network. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Absolutely. You can find me on Twitter, uh, Lou MM. And also all of my work that I do during the day is at crm.dynamics.com. Check out some of our new offerings that we have for in the cloud. Thanks so much. There you go, folks. Make sure to follow Lou. He's he's just, he's a smart guy. And you know what? He's really nice. Like, way nicer than we normally have on Twilight. So. <laughs> nicer than that Chebert guy. Yeah, I know. I have, have to look at that. <laughs> Speaking of that Chebert guy, Chebert, thank you very much again, my friend. It is always good to see you. I, I'll actually, I'll be out your way in a couple of weeks, which is why we're pre-recording an episode of Twilight next week because the two of us are going to be playing with quadcopters. Where can people find you? What have you been working on? Well, I um, I'm I do Twitter, you know, <laughs> ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. Um, I hopefully will be able to find enough time. My day job is sucking the life out of me with all these projects, but um, hopefully I will be able to finish up some articles on remote access. Um, there's a new product coming out from Ericom that's really cool, especially for VDI access. So hopefully that'll be appearing in InfoWorld and uh, hopefully a bunch of science articles um, hoping to change from uh, staff to faculty relatively soon. Science. We love science. We also love you. That's right. The loyal listener, the one who downloads our show each and every single week so that you can learn the latest and greatest in the enterprise. We want to do something for you. We want to make it easier for you for, for, to get our shows into your devices of choice. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find not only our entire back catalog, including our notes, anything that we've put into the, uh, the document, so you can check out links to stories that we've covered in any show, but you'll also find a little drop-down menu so you can get the audio version, the video version, the high-definition video version into your phone, your laptop, your iOS, Android, Windows device, no matter what it might be, we've got a version for you. If you want to get your Twiat fix, this is a great way to do it. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you go there, you'll be able to see what I've been doing during the week. You'll be able to see what projects I've been working on for the for know-how or Coding 101 or for this week in Enterprise Tech. And, of course, you're going to find out what Cranky Hippo is doing because, yeah, I like to make fun of Cranky Hippo. Lastly, I want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible. Of course, to Leo and to Lisa for supporting us for almost three years now. To Carson, my super producer, and to my fantastic TD. That's right, he is Eskimo Zach. Zach, I don't know if you have a camera turned on yourself, but uh, could you please jump on the mic and tell the folks where they can find you each and every single week? Yes, I've got a camera on myself. It's quite dark, but you can go to my Twitter where things are much brighter and happier. Thank you, Padre. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser. This has been This Week in Enterprise Tech. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.